With so much content out there, how do you filter through all the noise and cut straight to the value? What has become very apparent is that the best way to learn is to surround yourself with those you aspire to be. But you can't just watch what they do. At some point, you have to turn it into an action. Knowledge isn't power. Applied knowledge is power. On this podcast, you will go on a journey as we speak to people who are making a difference in their industries and people who, if we listen to closely and take action, can turn you into who you want to be. My name is Mark Sclair and this is Your Turning Point. A lot of people say, well, if I can do it, you can do it. Yeah, Yeah, but that's actually not true every single time. Leaders at their very core get the best out of the people that work for them. Why do you not celebrate? when you score a goal. Yeah. He said, it's my job. Yeah. So morale comes with achievement. And if you have a toxic employee or toxic leader, the whole thing comes tumbling down. Character over technical ability every single time. Um, you wouldn't put someone in an airplane who's been a passenger for a while. Mm. So really sitting down one to one. I mean, it's old fashioned, but it works. Yeah. Always look at the purpose, always try and have fun along the way. On the show today is Greg Turner, an executive level business and commercial leader who has worked with two flagship companies in the Middle East, Zaria and Mead, covering industries such as media, technology, business intelligence, publishing and events. I have personally worked with Greg. He saw something in me and promoted me to a leadership role. I wanted to get him on the show today because he has the experience and can articulate his knowledge in a way where you can pick up on some real insights about scaling teams, becoming a leader, and building a strong culture where people actually enjoy coming to work. Greg. Mark. (laughs) Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Pleasure. Yeah. Um, I want to start with a question, and it is around things that we felt were a problem in the past, which actually gave us the biggest lesson okay. and gave us like, a really positive strength for the future. So can you can you share a story of when that's happened for you, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably a few. But um, the one that comes to mind mostly, I think, from a career perspective, yeah, um, is enjoy the journey more than focusing on the destination. Okay. Um, An example of that is probably money. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, lots of people are working for money, and it's money's great if you've got a lot of it. Um, But the biggest, I think, mistake I've made in my career is taking a job purely based on the package and the financial rewards that were aligned to that role. And I was blinded by it, really. Mm-hmm. I'd had a pretty enjoyable career, purpose-driven career up until then. And I took this position just because it was a lot more than what I was being paid. And it looked like a good company. And I was blinded by it. I didn't do my due diligence. I didn't really look into the management team. And then almost from day one when I joined, I realized it was not a place for me. No. Um, it was pretty toxic. And a lot of the things that I enjoyed doing, I was unable to do. I wasn't engaged. Uh, I couldn't make the changes to drive the right kind of company culture mm. because I was restricted by the the board members and the people at the top. And, I, and to be frank, I was miserable. And every yeah. day I'd go in, I'd be miserable. Um, I managed to last about 11 months, um, but it was a pretty horrific time for me, both mentally and kind of career-wise. Um, and yeah. It all kind of went a bit wrong. Um, But looking back, I've never made that mistake again. I've always looked at organizations. I was looking to join teams I was building, always look at the purpose, always try and have fun along the way. And then the rewards will come. So that's probably the biggest lesson is don't chase the money, chase the purpose, enjoy the journey, don't focus on the destination. Yeah. the, The key things. So I think with that as well, I think self awareness is quite important there because. Yeah you know or you understood who you were and what you wanted not everybody kind of has that yeah they've got to kind of make those mistakes and i guess a bad situation had to happen for you yeah for you to realize actually that no this isn't what i want but a lot of people they're going for jobs they're going into companies and unfortunately a lot of people need the money i get that okay but let's let's focus on what we should look for in a business so when you don't make those mistakes now yeah going into a business 
what is it what is that process you go through like what would you look to do yeah which would be which would help people that's great understand what to do i think i've been on the other end of recruiting as well a lot yeah so i've been in thousands of interviews myself interviewing people for our teams i i we've done a lot together yeah um so i think it's tough at the beginning because it's confidence in yourself as an individual and the value you can bring companies. Mm. I think when you're early in your career, you think that you're going for an interview to try and sell yourself for a job and you neglect really trying to ask questions of the company. Mm -hmm. What can they do for you as a, as a candidate? Um, Is it right for you when actually often often a lot of the time you are just looking for experience and you want to learn. Mm -hmm. So, the power shift is quite different throughout your career when you're early on it feels like the company has all the power and the candidate doesn't and then later on in your career when you've built pretty good experience it's kind of equal and sometimes the other way around yeah a company really wants you you have the confidence and the ability to know what your worth is so Mm -hmm. i think there's an element of that but really understanding the people that you're going to be working with doing due diligence around them yeah culture for me is massive so trying to find some good questions that will lead the the company to be able to show you what their culture looks like. Mm. Examples of characters of people who are high performers, people who have not worked out, yeah. get, ask for examples of how they celebrate success. I mean, whatever it is that's packed, that is important to you, yeah. try and find some answers to questions that are not around just your job, mm. but the environment that you're going to be working in. Yeah. So I think that process before is... And that question, what is important to you? Yeah. Write that down and then start to speak to people about that. And I've even had people reach out to me like, hey, you're working at this company at the moment. Like, let, let, what's it like? Like, do you mind? Because I'm going for an interview here. So I think to do that due diligence beforehand, okay, it might take a bit of time. But if you, although people do job job jump around these days I'm thought and we'll get onto that as well <laughs> um I like the idea of being happy within a within a company yeah and if I have to do that bit of work first of all then so yeah. be it you know? definitely right yeah I think you get a feeling of a place when you walk into it as mm-hmm. well um which you often ignore if you're desperate for a job yeah uh, you get a feeling a gut feeling about the person that's interviewing you the way they interact with other staff members or if it's a panel how they interact with each other mm-hmm. you know for me a sign of a fantastic culture is do you hear is there energy do you hear laughter in the office true are people walking around and smiling how are they collaborating how are they talking to each other at their desks is stuff getting done um and for me i know what kind of environment i want to work in yeah i don't want to work in a library i want there to be (laughs) kind of action i want it to be fun i want it to be in a place where you feel like there's real energy if you walk into a company in an office and there's none of that it's probably not aligned to what you're what you're looking to try and find so if we go actually because what you just said there is a perfect way to walk into the next thing which i want to talk about is Hmm. (laughs) when you start a business or when you when you join a new company and i can speak from experience here because you joined the company that i was working at (laughs) yeah that must be eight years ago maybe a bit longer probably longer probably longer yeah yeah. well okay yeah time Uh, flies (laughs) yeah so you came in as the commercial director for the business Yeah. yeah and Everyone has a different way of doing things, but what was it that you felt those, those steps that you needed to take at the beginning? Because I think it's really good for the audience mm. to understand like the processes that people go through when they're trying to develop a team, trying to build a team, try to understand the current ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, firstly, it's different from the companies I join depending on what I think their requirements are okay. and the things that we've discussed during the interview. And I was talking to the board of, of that company about what they felt the business needed Mm. and hence I got recruited. And at that time, my specialism was very much around building sales and commercial teams, sales and marketing teams. Um, And we'd done it pretty successfully a couple of times in the past and we managed to exit a couple of those businesses. So um, the the, my remit was to really join the organization and try and accelerate the growth of the business around a specific data product that you guys were kind of trying to sell at the time. Um, uh, And also we, yeah, so I knew the business from the outside pretty well. Um, But the first step for me was really try to understand um, how good the sales team were. Mm. 
Um, and I, almost if you probably, you might remember this, but my first week on the job, pretty much if I remember, we're going back a bit, was actually asking every single one of you to present to me. Yeah. Um, I think we set up a role play scenario where I was a client um, and it, ha it was yourselves and your team and your manager at the time in the room. And I was effectively walked in and you guys had to present role play as if I was a customer. Mm. Um, and then I took a lot of notes and then I fed back to the manager and I think every one of you individually on the areas that I thought you guys could improve. Mm. And so I started off really by trying to put myself in the shoes of the customer and understand when they're interacting with that sales team, how they're feeling, what you guys were doing, what you're doing well, what you weren't. And also it helped inform a development plan around the individuals. Mm. My feeling at the time was that the sale, the outreach, that the new business team wasn't quite as effective as it needed to be. Um, and if we got that right, we could start to really accelerate the business. We could obviously bring in more clients. And then a few months after that, I would then turn my attention to the account management customer client facing client renewals team and then try and keep those customers happy. So mm -hmm. that's where I felt the growth was. Um, yeah, and it was pretty fun, wasn't it? It was pretty Do you fun. remember the... Do you remember the role play? I remember the role play. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for you me, you are bad, by the way. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I think not long before you joined, actually, I understood. I, I went on this journey of learning how to ask questions properly. Mm. And what I did was I, I wrote it down on a piece of paper the question I wanted to ask. But what you end up doing with that is, is that you're so hell bent on asking those questions. You're not really listening to what the client is saying. Yeah. So for me, I always advise people that when you've got those questions, they're there just in case. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you can't think of what to say, you've got a question there, but yeah. listen to what the client's saying. And this is, you could ask one question and it could answer all those five questions yeah. that you want to ask next. Yes. You know, so, uh, and how does the client feel if they're giving you five answers and you're asking the next question, they've already answered it. That's right. You know, that's, so you need to understand how the client's feeling. And I yeah. didn't want to make it feel like an interrogation. Yeah. So I was definitely streets ahead in regards to the other team, but I still definitely had a long way to go. Yeah. Because like we were discussing off camera before, you know, the tonality, how you deliver the question. Yeah. Uh, your verbal pausing, you know, actually taking time to ask the question before the next one have a bit of a pause. Let yeah. the client think what that answer is and let them process it. Otherwise, it just becomes surface level responses because yeah. they've, they've not had time to digest That's what right. you're trying to say. Yeah. That's right. So I think you said something here and I want to go back to that quickly. Looking at the business from the outside, yeah. you felt you had a good picture of it. Yeah. Yeah. What was <laughs> something which you like, because people see things from the outside, then they come and join or they get in it and they yeah. realize actually this is this isn't what it was what yeah. i thought it was yeah so was there anything there that you saw from the outside <laughs> when you got involved in it you're like actually something's weirder <laughs> <laughs> um this is probably my misfortune or fortune depending on which, which way you want to look at it but from my experience most companies when you're inside them are not run as well as you think they do from the outside yeah. um that normally means that you've got a good brand and a good product or something's really working. Yeah. And yeah. every company in the world, every employee in the world, every individual, every person can improve. Yeah. Mm. And businesses are effectively a group of people thrown together. So there's always ways you can get efficiencies and you can grow and, and improve. But I think the biggest thing for this organization, are we allowed to use company names? Well, I suppose it's easy. People can check on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, but Mead was a business that had been around since 19... 57? 1957, oh. yeah. Um, and I'd come across the business because we were kind of semi-competitors, I, I suppose, in the time, um, in the past. And the brand is fantastic, still is. It's a great legacy business in the, in, the, in the Middle East. So when I went inside the business, I was actually surprised about the lack of training and development and in sales ability, I think, mm. that existed because... The company was owned by a UK entity. You guys were kind of stuck out in the Middle East and to a large extent been neglected to a certain respect. So I just think you needed a bit of help and guidance mm. and we just needed to elevate the the kind of skill set, but more than anything, the belief and the, the level with which you guys could operate. And yeah. it didn't take long, to be honest. Once yeah. we showed you and we built that 
pro those processes around training and development and showed the impact that we could have on the company. Not forgotten. I think within about six to seven months, we were we were flying, yeah. as, especially in the team that you were in. Um, and then everything else started to fall into place because, you know, once you bring in more clients, more money, yeah. um, you can spend more money on developing the team. You can, especially in a, renewal, a subscription renewals business, the wheel starts to turn and things start to look really fun. So it wasn't a really difficult job um, because we had some pretty good people in the team like yourself yeah. um, <laughs> who, who we could kind of lean on and would be our kind of champions of change. Yeah, and I think and that's a good point in regards to champions. Like you need somebody there. And I think um, if you go into a room and the leaders aren't in there yeah, and you've got the team talking yeah, and you've got some toxic people, you know, soon enough, the whole room's going to be toxic. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what, what I want to talk about now is that like, how do you build morale within a team which has been kind of different managers, people have come in, they've promised the world, they've gone again. You know, how, hmm. how do you build that so they actually start to trust you? Yeah. Yeah. Building morale is interesting. I think trust is, okay, let's start with trust. Okay. I think that. Are they two separate things? I think so. Okay. Are they kind of aligned? They're, yeah. they're connected. Yeah. Um, people can trust you, but still be low on morale. Yeah, true. Um, okay. because there can be external situations that yeah. are affecting that. Um, so firstly, trust, I think trust is built, um, well, as a leader of an organization, mm -hmm. I think that you build trust within your employees by the kind of things you mentioned, doing the things you say you're going to do every day, um, showing vulnerability and weakness as well, like letting them know that you know, you're not perfect either. Yeah. Um, so having open communication with the people that you're working with. Being very clear at the beginning, which is something I really try, is let them know where we're trying to go. Yeah. And also be open to the fact that when you go through a change process, especially if you're improving and you're accelerating quickly, which is always what I try to achieve, is that not everyone makes it. Um, yeah. People will fall off the end and that's kind of okay because you don't all have to enjoy those changes and things might structurally or culturally might change and then people don't feel part of that journey anymore but letting them know that it's okay if that happens and to mm -hmm. come and speak to us and we'll either find a new job for them or we'll find opportunities outside the company so just really being very very aware of uh, communicating really clearly the journey with which the business is going to go through building that trust um, by delivering what you say you're going to deliver building relationships with people. Mm. So really sitting down one-to-one, -one. I mean, it's old fashioned, but it works. Yeah. yeah. Having conversations with your staff, finding out what motivates them. Often in, in your, our example, I found people in that organization that had been in roles for four or five years that were miserable and didn't want to do the job, no. did not want to do the job, but felt trapped because they didn't know who to go and who to talk to. And some of those we managed out of the business and it sounds like a cliche, but actually together we sat down and said, this is not going to work. Mm. What is it you want to do? How can I help you? Yeah. Yeah. And the next thing you know, they're thriving in other organizations or in other teams, other departments. Yeah. And you know this, but we had people who are on reception who now run customer success. We have people who are telesales guys who are running sales teams. You know, people move around. Mm. If you build the trust for them to have honest conversations with you about where they're at and how they're feeling. Yeah. So you do that a lot. If you build all that, then morale will come. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But morale is a result of achievement yeah um chicken or egg though isn't it yeah, yeah it is yeah, yeah. yeah. I, but i think you build trust yeah you help upskill and you make sure that the people that you're working with every day are coming in you're improving them in their day job yeah you're improving them as individuals as well that builds confidence you let them fail you don't jump on people and you build a safe place for them to come and experiment and to learn and to make mistakes mm. You do that over and over again, success will happen. There will be things that start to turn and things to improve. And then you build morale. Yeah. Um, and like I said, morale comes with achievement. So there's no point in celebrating like underachievement. No. Yeah. It's a bit of it's the wrong. A lot way of companies around. do though. A lot of companies yeah. celebrate mediocrity. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. Um so we always used to I think you probably remember this as well, but we would even build incentive plans or 
um, prizes around certain milestones yeah. and they have to be relevant to the achievement that you've done yeah? yeah we had amazing incentives in some other companies before where we'd send people to the Maldives or rolex watches or whatever sales teams love at the time but you wouldn't do that for hitting your monthly target no. yeah but for being the best salesperson of the year or the best account manager or winning the biggest client for a million dollars or whatever then you should reward people um, accordingly yeah and, th and a bit of competi healthy competition in the team i think is great when you say about hitting your monthly target, I just it reminds me <laughs> of hitting your monthly target. <laughs> of hitting a monthly target, that was nice. No, just um, it was a month, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just reminds me of Mario Balotelli. Mm. He was asked, "Why do you not celebrate when you score a goal?" Yeah. He said, "It's my job." Yeah. You know, yeah. and I think so many people they they want this instant gratification. Of, yeah. oh, you've done such a great job. And unless they're getting that, they're, they're not going to bother to perform for somebody. Oh, they haven't told me I've done great today. Like, yeah. So where's that balance, really? This just came to my head, really. Where's mm. that balance between motivating somebody like with uh, respect and, and not so much respect, but actually like giving them the support they need and then them having to actually do it themselves? That's a good question. I think, firstly, you need to build a framework and an environment which is constantly looking to improve and develop the people that work for you. Yeah. And that should filter down throughout the whole organization. So um, my responsibility now and in my previous jobs has always been to help leaders get the best out of their staff. So developing the leadership team within those organizations mm. um, to make sure that the teams that are working for them are um, improving and getting better every single day. Depending on the employee and the stage with which they're at their career and their journey, they'll need more or less day-to-day, -day, weekly interaction support. Mm. But to scale an organization, employees need to get on with their job. And they need to be ready every single day to be relatively self-sufficient. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I, when I come back to, again to building trust and creating a safe place, that means that they are comfortable and confident to go out into the workplace. If it's a sales guy, out to go to a sales meeting by himself without the support of the manager yeah, yeah? and do the right things. Yeah. But you need to be sure that you've onboarded, trained them and given them skills before that. Otherwise, you'll have a lack of confidence because they won't do a very good job. Mm. And then the things will come spiraling down. So we, we used to test and train a lot internally to make sure that the hardest sales presentation you'll ever have will be within your business in front of your manager, mm. in front of me, or in front of your colleagues, because they know the product as well as you, they know you as well as you in, in good teams, um, and they can rattle you and they can ask really difficult questions, etc. So when you go out into the world and you're trying to sell your product or you're trying to market your product or whatever it is, um, it should be relatively easy. Yeah. Um, and that builds confidence. And when you start to do that over and over again, then you can start scaling a company. So in answer to your question, Lots and lots of support and training at the very beginning of their journey within the company. Mm. Testing them, making sure, and lots of, depending again on the confidence of the employee, sometimes the first few meetings, sales meetings or whatever it's going to be, will be in support with the manager in person to help myself. I, I used to do sales trips around the UAE and around, um, around the region just to check in with customers, but also to support sales teams. Yeah. So that might be required at the beginning. And then after that, they're confident to go off and do it themselves. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's how, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it does. Yeah. It does. And it, it leads me nicely into the next part now, which is leaders. Yeah. Yeah. So you've led many men and women, as they say, <laughs> <laughs> into the battlefield. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what's nice about your experience, actually, because you've got experience with sales teams, yeah. but then you've also got experience with the managers and the leaders which have led those teams. Yeah. So those people are coming to you. They've got a lot of problems with the team. Yeah. Uh, they could have been working in that team already. Like that was my experience as well. Yeah. yeah. So what I, for the audience. Did you just drop in that I promoted you, is that basically? <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. So may, maybe you'll answer it with, with what I'm about to ask. But um, what is it that you look for? So mm. what is it you look for within a person when you want to promote them or make them a leader? It doesn't need to be that they were in the team already. Yeah. But somebody coming into the business. Yeah. What does, what does a leader mean to you? Yeah. Um, 
It's a, it's a, it's a good question. It's a really good question. I think that um, leadership is a really interesting topic and one that really fascinates me, to be honest, Mark. I think that overall, leaders at their very core get the best out of the people that work for them. Okay. Um, and there's a very specific set of skill sets that are required for that to happen. And I think some people have them nat more naturally than others, but it can be taught um, if you are really motivated and passionate about becoming a good leader. Mm. Um, and there's loads of cliches that yeah. you can pull out here. Um, but really the things like leaders le eat last and all those kinds of things, I 100% agree with. So a, a, a character and a person who can put the team in front of themselves um, make them the priority and to and to really focus on every single day trying to make sure that the people that work for them are getting better as in technical whether it's sales marketing hr actually at their job but also as individuals and people so that when they go home to their families you know they're they're better human beings mm. um and you need to do both i have exited for want of a nicer word um and quite a few people in my organizations that i work for who have been technically brilliant but ethically or character wise we're not quite the types of people or leaders that i'd want in the business mm. and if you have a toxic employee or toxic leader the whole thing comes tumbling down so for me character over technical ability every single time it's hard testing that yeah um but again, like I come back to my point, if you know, if you try to get to know the people that work for you, mm. you see it. I mean, yeah. you're a golfer. Yeah. Um, so golf is a good analogy for character. You know, the guy who, when no one's watching, picks the ball out of the rough and drops it on the fairway. Yeah. 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 Um, he's not probably someone you want in your team. No. So character is how you behave when no one's watching. Mm. And in businesses, there's always like inklings of how that, you can see those things seeping in out into the environment, depending on how people are working and operating. So for me, that would be the key. Um, but it's hard, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a hard transition that people make from salesperson, marketing, individual contributor, having to think about themselves, to then think about the team. I remember you going through it. Yeah. Um, so that that was me my question yeah. actually. So why why are there so many? successful salespeople <laughs> who get this promotion and they become a manager i won't call them a leader but they become a manager mm. and they fail well listen firstly i think it's too easy to point the finger at the individual most companies i have interacted with worked with and now um in my current business are trying to help um have neglected that side of the journey within mm. employees kind of process so you wouldn't do it in many other industries would you you wouldn't i don't know you wouldn't take a person who can sail a little i don't know who steers a sailboat and then make them a captain straight yeah. away and not give them the skill sets to mm. be able to do it yeah um you wouldn't put someone in an airplane who's been a passenger for a while and then stick him in the front and ask them to drive it drive it fly it <laughs> fly it. um without giving them the skills and the capabilities to do so so mm. i think the fault is always most of the time is at the company level where it's an easy promotion to make mm. because it makes sense and they think that all the other salespeople or yeah salespeople specifically will follow them because they've been good at their job um but that individual has been focusing on one thing most of that career and mm. that is achieving their target for themselves self-reliant on themselves eating what they kill being competitive and building that mindset, that tunnel vision, mm. when leadership's the complete opposite. Leadership's about being broad in your vision, looking at other people, sacrificing yourself for the team. Like I mentioned, eating last, going to bed every night, yeah. worrying about the people that are working for you mm. um, that might have personal problems or of going through life. Um, and that's a tough transition to make. So you've got to help the employee along that journey. And yeah. most times when they fail, it's the company yeah. hasn't done that. Either they haven't done it beforehand so that they're ready to take on the job or they're not supporting them through the process. No. And they just plonk them in the job and say, good luck. 
Um, yeah, and it can ruin careers. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, and I think, yeah. and I, I think there'll be a theme every podcast I do here, which is you know the social pressure yeah. of what you're still in sales. Well, no, you should be a manager by now. You should yeah. be a leader by now. So people, they, they take this journey. But we will both know there's many salespeople who earn much, much more than what sales managers do. Yeah. You know, so it's not a bad thing to be in sales. It's no. either, like the more experience you have, you can actually have assistance with you. So it takes away a lot of that data entry work. You don't need to be doing that. Yeah. Like, you need to be looking at money generating activities yeah. every single day. And even gets down to the point of uh, shopping and cooking. Yeah. You know, yeah. if it's going to take you an hour to cook, could you not earn more money working and bringing somebody in to do that? Yeah. So it's making these smart choices now. Like, okay, you want to elevate up. You don't need to have a promotion. No. You just, you need to master and bring in more people into that team. Yeah. But I think going, when we talk about leadership as well, there's a good podcast I was listening to the other day. It was an interview with Glenn Hoddle. Mm. And one of the most talented footballer players of anyone's generation, yeah. really. Yeah, really, really was. And what a lot of people don't know is he played at Monaco. Yeah. And the manager at that time was Arsene Wenger. Yeah. yeah. And he had no thought of going into management, okay? And he was speaking with Arsene Wenger. He said, "You, I think you'd be a good manager or a good leader. He said, I, I don't think I will. And he goes, no, I watch you with the players. And the one thing you have which most people don't have when they've got this ability is patience. Yeah. Yeah. Humble, and he said, yeah. not just that, but a lot of people say, well, if I can do it, you can do it. Yeah. yeah. But that's actually not true every single time. And you'll get a person that takes on a team, which isn't at their level, Yeah. but they expect them to be at that level. But if you've got the patience and sit with them and go through that journey with them, you know, they don't feel that they're just going to get attacked every single day because you've got this calmness around you. That's right. There's accountability, don't get me wrong, but yeah. like you said, you give them a room to fail. Yeah. And I just thought that was, when you look at somebody who's got this natural born ability to play football, and then he ends up leading England yeah. and Chelsea and yeah. Swindon, which yeah. not, pe not, not yeah. many people know either, no. took them up, promoted them, they were fourth bottom. Yeah. And um, it's just a really interesting story about, and that's why I like talking about football, because it transitions into yeah. leadership and management yeah. in business. Yeah. That person could have been like, I'm the best. Yes. You've got to get to my standards. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to get to my standards. I'm going to help you along the way. Yeah, exactly. 100%. That, yeah. And if you wanted to use that football analogy of that era, um, you see someone like Glenn Hoddle. Um, I think spoke maybe for the role he played as well, he was a passer of the ball. So, mm. you know, you want people in your team who pass the ball, you know, using the metaphor. Yeah. And you want leaders who pass the ball. Yeah. Um, but you probably wouldn't make Paul Gascoigne your manager. No. Yeah? Because, again, he had the innate ability. Yeah. But he's not someone that you would want to lead and build a culture around. No. Because yeah, just there wouldn't be the right kind of skill set that you'd need around discipline and turning up every day and so on, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting, isn't it? So I think um, another thing, <laughs> what I have seen in teams, um, a manager comes in or a leader comes in and they put their neck on the line a little bit too much mm -hmm. I think and that is that you sit down with the leader in the team and you say right how's the team doing are oh, they doing good yeah this yeah. and that and, and they, all right so how's the month going to go we're definitely going to hit our month <laughs> yeah. yeah we're definitely yeah. going to hit the quarter we're going to yeah. you know yeah. and they're you know they're standing up for the team they believe in the team mm. but one thing I think people lack is uh, an ability to report up yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. that's a skill by itself I think yeah yeah so how <laughs> would how would you best advise somebody? Because I'll give you an example, okay? Someone that we know, I won't mention any names, <laughs> but he would have a weekly meeting with us, yeah? And he'd sit down and he'd get everyone in the room and they'd say, right, we've got, you've got 20 opportunities. How many are you going to close this week? And some would say five, some <laughs> would say 10, some would say 20, yeah? But he would know from that person's, uh, the conversations beforehand, how much to trust that person whether they're actually going to deliver or not. So he would know that with me, if I've got 20 opportunities and I say I'm going to close five of them, realistically about 80%. So he would report up and say four of them I'm going to close. Yeah. Whereas another person would say, hey, I've got 20 opportunities, I'm going to close 15 of them. Yeah, yeah he's literally going to say like 5% of that. Yeah. So he would report up in that sort of way. Yeah. But I think every uh, certain people, they get like, oh, we're going to 
smash it. We're going to deliver. Mm. And it's just, it's not realistic. No. So how, and I'm sure you've seen people fall on their swords. Yeah. Yeah. By reporting up. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's a, it's a funny process. I think, um, I know who you're talking about as well. <laughs> um, but listen, if, if you want to learn from that, I suppose, the takeaway from that manager is that he knew his team really well. Yeah. Yeah. And he allowed them the the freedom to continue to, you know, communicate and be positive. You mm. want to look at it from a certain point of view. Some people are half glass empty and half, some are half glass full kind of people. And so he continued to allow them to be that way and then would just filter out his opinion and then he would provide me with the number yeah. and then it would probably go up to the board and then I would change it again yeah because you're uh, reporting up as well yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which I find a little convoluted to be honest I think if you were going to look at it from a really really strong well if you looked at it from a place of efficiency it's probably not the best way to run a business to mm. be frank yeah um, because there's probably an element within those layers where there isn't a huge amount of trust, mm. yeah, if you wanted to be really cold about it. But it worked. Um, and he was a fantastic forecaster, yeah, so he kind of got it right a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, so we would sit, me and him would sit down and have quite a few conversations about that. So I think the lesson to take away from it, really the easiest lesson is know the individuals that you're working for, mm. that are working with you, and build a system that works for the company. Um, it's always good to have some buffer. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you do also communicate that. Yeah. Yeah. The way we, me and him used to communicate would be in ranges. If you remember like good, bad and yeah. <laughs> middle, um, like what's the worst case scenario. That's often, I mean, if you remember his forecasting, what's the worst case scenario, best case scenario, and we'd not kind of land in the middle and it, and it seemed to work for us at the time. Mm. But luckily in our business, it was a subscription business. So it wasn't, so chunky when it came to the impact of revenue um and you start to build a process within the team where at that point we were so well drilled as mm -hmm. an organization if you remember that we were hitting forecasts pretty much every month for probably about three years in a row we got into a process of doing it so well that the conversation wasn't a negative one around like it's a disaster mm. we're missing it's it was normally about how much we were going over um, and just managing expectations yeah. from a business point of view um, because all the stuff had been done before that. So there'd been loads of work around pipeline management. There'd been loads of effort around really understanding where your deals were in the work in the in that process. Mm. And once you can start to tag all that, the end result is relatively predictable. So after, I think, about a year of that, we started to really fly for about two and a half, three years where yeah. things were, were rosy. Yeah. <laughs> until we promoted you <laughs> no no I'm joking I'm joking <laughs> well then I came away from the team and that's when it all fell down that's yeah? right yeah, that's yeah, right, that's yeah. Exactly. that's right don't rely on one person to bring in all your revenue and <laughs> I, I just want to touch on that quickly actually because this is a lot of the times why people don't get promoted yeah because, oh, because they become too good in their role it's they become all... too good in their role yeah. and who can fill that seat yeah. so there's a whole yeah. number that's missing there yeah and then they get promoted but then <laughs> they get asked to bring in a number as well along with yeah. their team number yeah and yeah. I would say it's almost impossible. To yeah, do. it's yeah. the hardest job yeah. I've experienced. Um, I did it myself a bit. Um, but yeah, it's the hardest transition that people make in organizations. In my experience is that individual contributor to kind of play a coach role, mm. which is a bit of a funny one. Yeah. Um, the way we did it, I think, and I try and do, is that there's a real finite time in that space. So it's not, oh, if you do well, yeah. you're then going to get the management job and you can give away all your sales leads to someone else and you can just manage um, at some distant time in the future. I think if I'm right, and correct me if I'm wrong, we try, I try as much as possible to say, okay, you're going to do this for three months mm. just to get your foot in the door and to really understand the process and it's going to be super tough. Um but normally we would try then for that transition period to have that target that's put on your head as a collective one so you could bring it in or your team mm. and either way you'd get paid um, mm. to make it as easy a transition as possible. And although that period is very tough, I think it's quite a good learning for the individual yeah. to see what is their job and their life is going to be like in the future and whether they want it or not yeah. because it it's challenging. Um, 
and I've seen quite a few people transition through that quite successfully. You did okay, I think. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so just make sure that time is finite. Otherwise, you, people are trading water and then the team don't know how to respond to that individual. Yeah. Are they going to be my boss? It's like a caretaker manager. Yeah, if you want to use your football analogy. Yeah. yeah, they come in. It's like, well, I don't know. Are they going to be here next season? Do I really need to try? Mm. And they used to be my teammate. And there's going to be some resentment sometimes around you've been promoted instead of someone else. Mm. Um, so there's ways of individuals can potentially sabotage that promotion unless you get it right. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a difficult process to work through. So there's something which I talk about a lot, which is, um, being nice doesn't get you everywhere. Okay. <laughs> doesn't get you everywhere. Doesn't or get you everywhere does okay. it? Yeah. So my point is that somebody gets promoted or they start leading a team and they're the nice guy. Mm. Everyone loves them. Mm. Everyone wants to be around them. Everyone enjoys them, but mm. their numbers are still down. Yeah. You know, because that person wants to be friends with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So where 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 does that line draw really yeah. between, hey, you're part of my team, we're gonna be friends and I wanna help you and everything, but yeah. let's get some work done. Yeah. It's a good question. I think um a question I ask a lot in an interview of future managers or leaders, um, and more than anything I ask it, because I kind of know what people are gonna say, but it's just yeah to let them know what my, my thought is, is I ask them whether they'd rather be liked or respected if they had a choice of just the one. And you, what would you like to be? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, tough question. Yeah. Uh, I think, um, well, 100% respected, yeah? Okay. Because not everyone is gonna like you. Um, you won't get on with everyone at work. No. Not everyone's gonna be your mate. Um, not. And likewise, when you're managing people, um, it's almost even harder that you, because you, you want to be as fair and as equal with every person that you're developing and managing and leading. Mm. Um, but naturally, there's some that you're going to get on with better than others. There's some that you'll, you're more naturally going to gravitate towards or want to spend time with, etc. cetera. Um, but ultimately, you're there to do a job. And like I come back to, yeah, there to help and develop them. And the only, the only kind of blocker sometimes is if you're chasing popularity, mm. you often lose the respect. Yeah. Because people don't think you're authentic. Mm. True. Um, they'll think, well, it's just something he's telling me because he wants me to like him. Yeah. Or you'll sit in a room and talk about someone else behind their back or or whatever it's going to just to be popular yeah it's it's never going to work um so you try to create a line when you're managing or leading you try and create a, a certain line between the two but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be nice no so nice being liked and respected are also different things yeah being nice and fair to everyone is important mm. You can build respect without being nasty. Yeah. Yeah. Often the opposite. Um, but back to my point, you had to be authentic. Yeah. I think you can have, let's have fun. Yeah. But we've, and I've mapped this out for us at the beginning. Like this is the vision. This is where we want to get to. Yeah. Do we feel that what we're doing right now is actually going to get us there? Yeah. So we can have the fun, but are we actually going to get to where we want to be? Yeah. yeah. And if that's not, then let's continue and actually work, which we that's want right. to do. Yeah. And we celebrate it at the end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, work is hard, yeah? It, and it, sometimes it's challenging. And you're working with, again, I come back to it, lots of different types of people. And if you built your business right, yeah. there are different types of people. Instead of just always recruiting the same people that are like you and re recruiting to type and just building lots of, of your of your cohort around you that what you does that mix look like actually because that's what i wanted to like <laughs> is what sort of personalities would you say makes a good little team um again it depends on the team yeah um we don't want to keep using football analogies <laughs> um but um like i i, I think i put this on linkedin a while ago uh, <clears throat> every team needs a nicky butt yeah yeah or these days every team needs a, a rodgery at man city yeah yeah he breaks the play up and passes the ball on and then de bruyne and the other guys do the magic mm. you don't want rodgery up front no trying to score goals and often in business people want to be up front scoring goals when actually building a team means that you need diversity of thought 
of culture and as much as possible. And then you need to build a safe space for them to all be able to voice their opinion. Mm. Um, and you need an environment that people can put their hands up and talk without being afraid of being shot down. Mm. And for me, a key thing that I always try and focus on is build a company where people don't have to be anyone else at work apart from themselves. And I see a lot of times in companies where you almost see people leaving the office and then put their work face on when they arrive and then mm. their home face on when they leave. And it's like you're, diff you're two different people. That is draining. That yeah. is hard work and it's never really going to work because they're trying to pretend to be someone else because there's a type in the office that's going to succeed. Um, so a big sense for me is that you create a culture and an environment where people can be themselves in the workplace. Mm. Then magic happens. Um, and that's difficult as a new manager because I come back to my point. You'll interview someone, you'll get on with them. Yeah. And you're like, this is, he seems like a good guy. And then you come back to the same point. It's that you, maybe you're trying to be liked and you're trying to build a team of mates around you. Yeah. When actually you need people who can come and give you different opinions and push back. And me, when I'm building, it gets lonelier and lonelier at the top. I need management team and colleagues, et cetera, who are different to me to say, Greg, you know, this is not, we need to not do it that way. Or yeah. you made a mistake here or slow down or actually try to praise someone because you're moving too quickly and mm. these people need recognition. So people that can point out your blind spots as well um, and then have the ability and the humbleness to listen. Mm. Okay. So we're coming towards the end of the show and there's a few questions that I want to fit in. But just before uh, we get to those, I don't know if you remember, but my initiation. Okay. Do you remember? No. no. Remind me. <laughs> I don't know if we're going, maybe we need Do to- Do we have to sing? Maybe we need to call in HR here or something. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they get called in for afterwards. Maybe you'll be investigated afterwards. <laughs> I don't know. But when I was very fortunate enough to have the internal promotion, yeah, yeah, we <laughs> there was an initiation supposedly. I don't know if you made this up for me. Probably. But there, there was an initiation for a manager now yeah. who had to do something, some something. And my thing was- that in a meeting, oh, I remember this. Yeah, yeah, in a management meeting, yeah, with the CEO at the time, <laughs> yeah, I had to <laughs> include certain words, sentences and words, yeah, whilst yeah, I, I was speaking to him, yeah, 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 and <laughs> I, I waited till the very end, and I said <laughs> at the very end, I had to include, I think it was like sweet and nice or something like that. That's right. Yeah. I remember now. Yeah. 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 yeah, so then I, Don't I take said, my kindness for sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. something along those lines because <laughs> yeah. I will, I will fight for the team. I would do this, yeah. but I use those. those Don't take my work. kindness for weakness. Don't take my kindness for weakness. That's right. I remember yeah. now. It came back to me. Yeah, good <laughs> yeah. initiation. Good initiation. Yeah. yeah, and and the thing is as well, you know, some people might say, "Well, you can't do that." You mm. know, these days, I think it's ridiculous. You can't do anything. Okay. Yeah, but you realize that the person was part of the team, wanted to yeah. be part of the team. Like if I didn't want to be part of the team, I wouldn't have done it. I'd have gone, yeah. no, I'm not doing that. Yeah. You know, so I think it's important and it definitely built morale Yeah. because there was other people in, in the team that were yeah. the same level as me that were like, hey, you know, he's stepping up and he stepped up That's and right. uh, yeah. it made me feel part of the team more, yeah. yeah. We had to buy you lunch though, didn't we? Because you, <laughs> did, you did it successfully. I think yeah. that was the bet. Yeah. yeah. Also, I think sometimes you demystify the um, seriousness of a boardroom or of a senior management meeting, yeah. which is also something I try and do, is you need to be as comfortable as possible in the environment that you're working. Mm. So part of that semi-deliberate uh, initiation is to not be so serious in what is perceived as a very serious environment, which mm. I think was a w monthly reporting meeting with the CEO or whoever yeah. it was at the time. Um, because we still did the job, yeah? We still had a very productive meeting, yeah. but you also had something that you needed to kind of slip in there. Um, so it just, it created a bit of a, yeah, a bit of an interesting vibe amongst us. It was good yeah. fun, wasn't it? It yeah. was, you know, every day I'd come into work and I'd, I'd enjoy being there. Yeah. There was some battles, which, yeah. I, which I actually enjoyed the most. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Just to give that some context, really, like I took over a product which was the foundation of the business, yeah. but was left yeah. and wasn't respected Languishing. or appreciated yeah. or anything. Yeah. yeah. So I came in and I, I got the team to un or believe or trust and yeah. give me that little bit of opportunity that I'm there to fight for them. That's because right. Because too many managers have come in, 
promised yeah. the world, didn't deliver. That's right. You know, and then they saw, and I made sure they saw when I'd go to battle against yeah. other people that were just giving a product away for free. That's right. Because they're like, actually, he's actually fighting for us. Yeah, here. that's right. You know, so I was always, um, I will always be proud of like that moment uh, yeah. within within my career. Yeah, yeah, good. So I think it moves us on to the last two questions, which one of them I, I would normally ask, how can I be better as a podcaster? <laughs> okay. And if you want to answer that, please feel free. <laughs> yeah, you should but, maybe get better guests. <laughs> <laughs> we've got to start talking about me, by the way. We've got to other. start somewhere. <laughs> <haven't we? laughs> um, one is how can I be better as a podcaster? But I think as well, because we've got this relationship and the time together, Yeah. how could I be better as a leader? Okay, listen, I think that um, firstly, you're, you're a good leader. Uh, I'm okay. sure you still are. Um, so my assessment of you would not be anything really specific. I think by the time you get into those positions and you're, you had the natural capabilities and characteristics anyway of, a good leader you had all the foundations always a very ethical guy always well respected um and liked i'd, I'd add um and always cared about the job and doing well so they're the kind of key foundations um so then for me improvement then comes at the one percent is the marginal gain stuff then mm. it's like how do i do everything else a little bit better um <clears throat> and i think the one thing you've done really impressively since we haven't worked together is this ongoing learning that your journey that you're going on of like constantly listening to podcasts reading books we were talking about it before we sat down today you've always every time we sit down you've read something you pick something up yeah. you're kind of you have this thir thirst for knowledge um and then it's just about applying mm. all those little nuggets that you that you're picking up along the way um so that would be my advice is just keep going and then yeah. just always look at how you can just make the small one percent marginal gain improvements thank you i think in, in my intro i actually say knowledge isn't power applied knowledge is power. yeah you yeah know? that's great yeah so yeah. it moves me on to my last question yeah which is what should i have asked you um if i try and come up with a question then are you gonna then ask it no <laughs> <laughs> um i think a good question for leadership is uh, i'm a father now Okay. Um, so yeah. maybe you can ask this of your next guest, if they're a parent, is what what have you learned through being a parent that you think you can apply to leadership within business? Love that. If you Love want to that. try and ask that question. Okay, brilliant. Well, look, Greg, uh, not just for today, I want to thank you for, because even after we finished working together, which is what I really appreciate, we've always had these times where we've met up yeah, and shared knowledge and you know, giving insights to each other. You've helped me a lot with certain things going on as well. So yeah. I really, really appreciate that. Yeah, and that's why it's so important not to burn bridges with people. Yeah. You know, you have a relationship. Let's keep it going. Yeah. And um, I really appreciate that. So yeah. thank you very much for being on the show. Hey, pleasure. Thank, thank you very you. much for having me. Thank Cheers, you. Mark. Thanks.